Dr. Hogan is Academic Dean and Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at Kenrick Lennon Seminary. He has a PhD in Systematic Theology from Boston College, specializing in the relationship between theology and science. Ed previously served at the Archdiocese of St. Louis as the director of Paul VI Institute, where he helped create the Archdiocesan Lay Formation. Ed is a theological advisor to the Society of Catholic Scientists and Eden Invitation Ministry. Ed has taught theology on the high school, college, and graduate school levels, as well as in parishes and adult faith formation programs. He and his wife, Jen, have been married for 30 years, have six wonderful children, and are members of St. Paul, John, Paul II Parish. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Hogan. Thank you, Mary. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for that act of spiritual generosity, praying for us. I'm going to set this up in front. If you don't have one of these yet, if you didn't pick one up on the way in, please pick one up on the back podium. Maybe Kate could hand them out even if you don't have one of these. I'm going to set it up in front of me. This is a sculpture, so we're going to talk about change this morning. This was a sculpture that was done by a friend of mine, an IHM sister in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You need to picture it. It's about this high. So you can just picture it up here on either side of me. And it's called Mary, Woman of the Eucharist. And if you look at it, what you'll see, the, the backstory is, this is Mary having received communion at Mass from the Apostle John. And you'll notice where she's holding Christ present in the Blessed Sacrament. Right at the level of her womb. And we're going to end with a reflection on that, but as I give this talk today, I, I just want you to have that image in mind and how Mary in that image, captured so beautifully by this nun who's a great sculptor, was contemplating the changes in the mode of Jesus' presence to her. And you can see the look on her face. She's recollecting. I held him once in my womb. I went through all kinds of changes with him. I hold him now in my hands. So I think along with Mary, women have a special gift of rolling with changes. And I wonder if we can contemplate change with Mary's heart. So I was present when Archbishop Rosansky delivered the State of the Archdiocese Address to the Archdiocesan offices at the end of May. And he spoke about change. He said, look, change is on the horizon with all things new. And he situated the upcoming change with respect to two things. First, theologically, with respect to the ascension of Jesus, because it was, in fact, ascension week. And second, practically, with respect to parenting and the changes that parents experience. And I thought, gosh, that's a really helpful framework. I wish more people could hear about that. So I propose that we think about those two things together this morning, change and the ascension, and change and parenting. And I propose that we ask constantly these two questions. How do those changes relate to my spiritual life? And how do those changes relate to the way we think about changes in parish life? And then we conclude with a reflection on how Mary held change in her heart and how we might hold it in ours. Okay, so first, let's talk about the ascension. When most people think about the ascension, they begin and end 
with where I began and ended for a long time in my life. At the ascension, Jesus left, period. Jesus was here for 33 years, then he left. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit came because Jesus was gone. And so the church carried on without Jesus, but with the Holy Spirit, fair trade. See, that's not entirely wrong. In fact, it's partially true. The problem is it's not true enough. There's more truth for us. It doesn't explain what makes the ascension a mystery. So a mystery is always about the relationship between the infinite and the finite. If he's just gone, that's no big mystery. He's gone. People do that. If we want to think adequately about the ascension as a mystery, we have to think about change. Specifically, changes in the way Jesus is present to us. Let me frame the point this way. I'll frame it with three points. I'm famous for that here at the seminary. I just have three things to say. Jesus was present to the world from all eternity. He is, after all, God. And God is always present everywhere. But Jesus was present in a hidden way from all creation. In fact, it's really fun to read the Old Testament that way. As you listen to the first reading this past Sunday on Trinity Sunday, I want you to just hear this reading and think to yourself, is that Jesus or is that the Holy Spirit? This is from the book of Proverbs. Thus says the wisdom of God, the Lord possessed me, the beginning of his ways, the forerunner of his prodigies of long ago. From of old I was poured forth, at the first before the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains or springs of water. Before the mountains were settled into place, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet the earth and fields were not made, nor the first clods of the world. When the Lord established the heavens, I was there. When he marked out the vault over the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he fixed fast the foundations of the earth, when he set for the sea its limit, so that the waters should not transgress his command, then was I beside him as his craftsman, and I was his delight day by day, playing before him all the while, playing on the surface of his earth, and I found delight in the human race. That's a Jewish description of wisdom. Gosh, does that sound like the Son, proceeding from the Father, being present in creation, working with the Father, playing here, delighting in us, but in a hidden way. It was really fun, as I said, to read the Old Testament that way. You read the whole Old Testament that way and ask yourself again and again, is that the Son or is that the Spirit? And the answer is yes. They weren't sure. <laughs> but then Jesus became present to the world in a new way in the Incarnation. Now his presence was open and physical. And you know what? That was startling for people. It took some getting used to. They weren't used to the change in his way of being present. It wasn't obvious how that could be that God would be in the flesh or what that meant. In fact, that's one of the great questions of the Gospels. How can God be present in the flesh? That wasn't how we were thinking of his presence before. Right, but he changed his mode of presence. And that took some getting used to. Well, at the ascension, it doesn't make any sense for Jesus to become absent because that's not how God works. God is always broadening and deepening what he does in the world. Let's look at the theme of the ark. In the Old Testament, the ark was a particular thing where God dwelt. In the Gospels, Mary is the particular person 
in whom God dwells as he previously dwelt in the ark. And then after that, we become the ark of God's presence in the world by the gift of the Holy Spirit. God constantly deepening what he's doing. So against that background, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, Jesus became absent. No, 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 how, how did he deepen his presence? At the ascension, Jesus became present to the world in a new way yet again. Now, not openly and physically, but quietly and mystically. Not as someone present outside of us, but as someone present inside of us. And that took some getting used to. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up at the sky? Well, because there was Jesus. Yeah, that's not the game anymore. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. So let's pause there and contemplate those changes in Jesus' way of being present in salvation history. And let's ask, might that shed any light on changes in my spiritual life? Has God been present to me in different ways throughout my life? I bet you he has. What does that have to do with upcoming changes in parish life? What will take some getting used to as things change? How will we deal with that? How long will we stand gazing up at the sky, relating to Jesus in this old mode of relating, rather than moving into the next phase? You know, it's not entirely unlike married love in these three phases. One, before you have children, you relate to your spouse in a particular way, right? Two, while you're having and raising children, that requires that you relate to your spouse in a new way. And three, after you're done raising your children and they're out of the house. The married love is always there, but it changes its mode of expression and those changes Take some getting used to. We can make the transition well, or we can make the transition poorly. Most of us are a mixed bag. Well, what lessons do we learn from those transitions for these transitions, which the archdiocese is facing? Do you, as women, carry the genius of those changes in a particular way? that can be of service not only to you, but to everyone around you. I propose that you do. Let me give some other examples about changes in the mode of being present, because it's a strange expression. But to stir your recollections of changes, and always to draw us back to our two questions, does that shed any light on how God has been present to me in my life in different ways? Does that shed any light on how we can face changes in the archdiocese? So for example, when I started singing at mass in college, I was part of the liturgical choir. I was present to the performance of liturgical music and I was a good performer. And that was good, because you want people who are skillful at what they do. And we worked hard at that. But the longer I stayed and was trained in liturgical ministry by one of my great heroes, and she's one of my great heroes because she's only ever doing one thing. She is listening to Jesus' presence in her heart, whether she's teaching or doing music, or doing administrative tasks, or doing spiritual direction, or eating lunch, or making dinner, you name it. She's just being present to Jesus. I love that. I aspire to that. I'm not there yet. But she's the one who is training us. Well, you can imagine with someone like that around, you can't just stay at the level of performance. 
She was training us in how to be present to prayer in the midst of song. And so the more I stayed with her and was taught by her, the more I became present to prayer in the midst of music. And I never stopped working at performance, but I became present to something deeper. And I would say I became a better liturgical musician because I could do those two things at once. When I was a young teacher, I was present to my lecture notes. And that's good. There there were certain things we needed to cover, right? The longer I taught, the more I became present to whether or not my students were following my lecture notes. And that was better. But the longer I taught, the more I became present to my students' questions and concerns as I was writing my lecture notes so that my lecture notes and their hearts and minds were coming together and transforming one another. And that was best of all. Sometimes I'm present to the problems my wife is talking to me about so I can fix them. And that's good. But if I'm really on my game as a husband, I try to be present to her in the midst of the problems, not to fix them, but to be together in them, because that's usually what she really wants. When we've been married for like 10 years, she would just say, I don't need you to fix this. I just want you to listen. (laughs) Okay, sit on my hands. I can do that. It was really hard. It doesn't mean I'm always good at it, but I'm present to something deeper than the problem, present to her in the midst of it. What matters is that we be together in the midst of it. And that's the great adventure of having children. People ask me, how's it going? And I say, we're in it together. So it's awesome. We have two teenage daughters. It's awesome. I love it. As long as we're in it together, the problem is not the thing. The being together is the thing. When I started graduate school, I was energized by the things I was receiving from my teachers, and rightly so. I had great teachers. I treasure them. When I finished, I started to be energized, and I'm still energized, by the things I'm giving as a teacher. That's a deeper thing. It's my responsibility to change the mode in which I'm energized. So let me draw closer to the matter and and just name three three ways that Jesus is present in my life and I notice changes in the way he's present to me. I've always been present to Jesus, or Jesus has always been present to me as the truth. That's important to me as a theologian, to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus as the truth. But the longer I've dwelt with Jesus there, the more he has made known to me his presence in how I present the truth because of how he presented the truth. At the seminary, we concentrate on that with our guys. They spend two years just being present to the Catholic faith in terms of knowing doctrines. If they don't know their doctrines, they have nothing to offer, right? What do, what do uh, med students spend their first year doing, first two years doing? Pounding the books, doing gross anatomy, right? Just studying so they'll have something to offer. But just the knowing something is not enough. Then we spend two years with them. Okay, now you know the doctrines. That's excellent. We spend two years with them teaching them how to build bridges. You know people don't understand those doctrines. You know, people don't live those doctrines. You know, people resent those doctrines. So how do you build a bridge from the doctrine to the person? And knowing what Jesus intends for people, how do you build a bridge from where a person is to where Jesus wants them to be? In my early years as an administrator, I was being present to getting stuff done. Jesus was helping me get stuff done, and I was grateful for that. 
the more I've been an administrator, the more I've let Jesus be present to me in fostering relations in the midst of getting stuff done. I'm a fair administrator, so I get a lot of stuff done. I have to. But I've become a good administrator because I've learned to pay attention to how I'm fostering relations or not while I'm getting stuff done. And you know what? It takes way more time and energy. But it's much more satisfying. And it's much more fruitful. I'm not alienating people as I get stuff done. I'm drawing people into relation as I get stuff done. And that's a fruit of the Spirit. Lastly, uh, being present to Mary while I'm saying the rosary, as we all were. But has Mary ever interrupted your prayer? To say, hey, stop talking at me and start talking to me. But she did that to me today. Something was on my heart in the midst of saying the rosary together. And she just gently said, can, 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 you, can you just, this is where your concern is. Can you just go there and show me your face? What is your concern there? Tell me about it. Because that's her genius as a mother. Don't talk to me about this when what's really on your heart is this. You should just ask about it and poke there. Okay, I'll talk to you about that. I'm going to go there and turn my face to you there. Because as a man, as a little boy, what do I do with my mother with a hurt? I go there and I turn my face away. I don't want to talk about this. You can just go there and, and turn your face to me there from that place. What is it that you need there? I love to pray the rosary. I always have my rosary with me, right? As Mother Teresa said, so I remember to keep my hand in hers. I have to do that all the time, and sometimes she interrupts me so that I'll tell her what's really on my heart. So back to the, oh, so finally notice this, because it's at the heart of the ascension. The apostles were energized for three years by what they received from Jesus, and that was awesome. And then when Jesus left at the ascension, they were energized by what they gave as members of Christ's mystical body. He changed his way of being present to them. Now he was present in them. And that's why after Pentecost, they can do things that before only he could do. You read the whole Acts of the Apostles and that's the story. Before only Jesus could do these things. Now the Apostles can do them too because the Holy Spirit is making the life of Christ present in them. And now they're energized by giving that away and drawing other people in. So like a, it was like a guy, Mary mentioned the lay formation program. We had a guy in the lay formation program and he came to me early on in the program. He said, I think I've listened to every Lighthouse Catholic media CD there is and all the Catholic podcasts in the world. But you're a theologian. You must know more stuff. Give me more stuff. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll think of some things and I'll come back and when we visit next month, we'll talk. So we meet every, once every month. And I came back and I, and I just prayed with that in the ensuing month and when I came back the next month, I said, no, you're done. You're done consuming. You're done being a consumer Catholic. You know all this stuff. You've been energized by it. It's time to be energized by giving, not by receiving. You need to start teaching. You need to gather men and form them and unleash them in the world. I'm not giving you any more stuff. He was startled and he thought about that and when he came back the next month he was on board yeah I'm gonna light it up and he did 
He went out and he started gathering and forming men to unleash them in the world. It was just asking him to change the mode of how he's letting Jesus be present to him. So why did Jesus leave in that sense? In the sense in which he did at the ascension. Why did he change his mode of being present to us? Why did he take away his physical mode of being present? Well, he said in John 16, it's better for you that I go. You see, he wanted us to grow. He wanted us to take the next step. God is always doing that with his people all through the Bible and all through our lives. Deeper, more. Further in, further up. In order to grow, we needed to stop relying on him as someone outside of us who would do things for us. And we needed to start relying on him as someone dwelling inside of us who did things with us and through us. And we never would have made that transition if he kept the training wheels on for all of history. So he left and said, do it yourself. I'll be with you. I'll be in you. And you will learn to sense my presence in you and work with it. But that's the next step for you because I want to do it through you, not for you. So he shifted from his physical body to his mystical body and his sacramental body. But that takes some getting used to. It took the apostles some getting used to. It's okay if it takes us some getting used to. So in the ascension, Jesus changed his mode of presence. And I ask you these questions. How has Jesus' mode of presence changed to you throughout your life? Is there anything in those changes that can help us deal with the changes we're about to face in parish life? Change is coming. How do you want to deal with it? How do you usually deal with it? I don't like change, personally. I especially don't like change on short notice. Do you notice any ways that how we deal with change is getting off track already? Because I do. I see it, I hear about it. What are some strategies for getting it back on track? So let me say a few words now about parenting. Let's talk about parenting and change. When people talk and think about parenting, they often talk about the joys of parenting and the hardships of parenting. And all that is true. There are joys and there are hardships. But we tend to think of that statically. What if we think about change and parenting? Because the joys and the hardships change at each stage. If you have children, think back. Did the mode of your parenting change when the child was in the womb and when the child became an infant? Or did it stay the same? Well, no, big change. <laughs> Scary changes. When the child was an infant and when the child became a toddler. Oh, now the child can run away from me. A whole new set of problems. Now I need to put safety locks on everything. And I need to plug all the outlets. When the child went from being a toddler to being a grade schooler, did the mode of parenting change? I don't know, I, I kept that child a toddler for years in my brain. Last summer, my 12-year-old daughter placed a five-paragraph essay at my breakfast place at the table so I would discover it. Why I should be allowed to pierce my ears by Mary Hogan. <laughs> That's good, it was good, and her opening line was, I am no longer your little girl. Fair enough. Right? So, yeah, you're not four anymore. You're 12, and that's different. Right? Not that I hadn't changed that, but 
Maybe I hadn't made all the changes that she thought I should. And so we were engaging in a little back and forth there. When they go from being a grade schooler to being an adolescent, when they go from an adolescent to being a teenager, when they go from a teenager to being a young adult, did you, did you have to make that transition? Of you're still trying to do things for your kids instead of teaching them to do them for themselves? And so on and so forth. How did that change over time? What was hard about the change? And what was good about the change? We're teaching our teenagers to cook. Everyone cooks every week. Because you need to, that's a skill you need to bring out into the world. Because one of our sons who just went off to college discovered it's easy to make friends if you know how to make cookies. <laughs> so I'm glad I taught him how to do that. What mistakes did you make in those transitions? Looking back, could you have been more deliberate about it? Archbishop Rosansky said this in his State of the Archdiocese address, and I'm pretty much quoting him here. It's tempting for parents to keep a child suspended in their imagination in some earlier phase of life and to fail to make the transition that growth requires. I am no longer your little girl. Fair enough. But parents can't hold on to the earlier phases, no matter how golden they may have been. Successful parenting requires investing time and energy in learning new ways of parenting. Then he said this, similarly, we can't suspend the archdiocese in our imagination and in our way of operating in a previous golden age of its existence. Like parents, we need to invest our time and energy in discovering new ways of carrying out our mission. It's painful. Okay, so let's come back to our two questions. Does our experience of parenting shed any light on how God has been present to us in the different stages of our life? And does our experience of parenting shed any light on how we might approach the changes that are coming to parish life? Let's conclude by turning to Mary. I'm just going to read this passage to you from Luke chapter 2. I want you to consider the changes that are happening here. Each year his parents went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, by the way, what is that in Judaism, 12 years old? It's when you get bar mitzvahed as a boy. And when you go through your bar mitzvah as a boy, you become an adult Jewish man and you decide for yourself how you are going to practice Judaism. There's no accident here. When he was 12 years old, this is happening. Ooh, we should have a sense of anticipation. Ooh, how's he going to carry this forward? After they had completed its days as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Did a 12-year-old surprise you with anything? Like a five-paragraph essay about why she should be allowed to pierce her ears? We didn't see that coming. No, you didn't. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And we know this about Mary. She was without sin from the moment of her conception all the days of her life. So whatever that anxiety is, it's not a sin. It's just the natural reaction of a mother. And how is Jesus going to handle that? Mother, stop sinning like that. It wasn't a sin. Yes, mother, that anxiety 
is natural. But you and I are called to something more than that. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I am 12 years old and I can decide for myself how to do this? Did you not know that having been bar mitzvahed, I must decide for myself how to live Judaism? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. This, this new mode of being present to me, I don't understand this. But how does she hold that? He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Why don't you just in your imagination and prayer walk with Mary into the Annunciation when Jesus changed his mode of being present to her. Now he's present in her womb. And then at the birth, when he changed his mode of being present to her. And then at the finding in the temple, when he changed his mode of being present to her. And then when he left home for ministry and changed his mode of being present to her. And then when he went through his death and resurrection and ascension and changed his mode of being present to her. And finally, when she received him in communion and he changed his mode of being present to her. And finally, when she was assumed body and soul into heaven, changed their mode of being present to one another yet again. How do we respond to change with sadness and fear and anger and rumors. That the ascension invites us into a different way to approach change. Our own experience of parenting invites us into a different way to approach change. And Mary, the woman of the Eucharist, who kept all these changes in her heart, who received him in communion that she had once borne in her womb and treasured that, invites us into a different way to approach change. So let's turn to Mary and ask her to teach us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary, you are the woman of the incarnation the woman of the Eucharist. You are a woman of change. You held all these changes in your heart and we ask you to draw us more deeply into your heart. Teach us your way of holding change. that in the midst of changes, we may always allow Jesus to be present to us in the different ways he wants to be present to us. And having shown us and given us your heart, Mary, help us to teach others to share in that heart. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.